glad to be here today. Let me check. How many of you just got drug here? If you got drug here, I can tell because it's, the hairs on one side are just where you got pulled down here. We're going to continue in our book of Acts. We're going to be in chapter 2. If you remember in chapter 1 of the book of Acts, last Sunday night we left off and there was 120 people gathered together in one building and they were all praying and praying and praying and praying and praying. And when we pick up today in chapter 2, it's been exactly 10 days now since they were up in that upper room just to pray in a way and they were praying and they were looking towards the day of Pentecost, which was a Jewish holiday they knew that was in front of them, Pentecost, uh, in case you don't know, and, and I don't know, uh, it, it was just now this year that I've been able to put and wrap my brain around exactly when Pentecost comes. So I'm going to explain to you today you, so you can always know when Pentecost is. You ready? I hope when you leave here today, you will always know how they figure out when Pentecost comes. This is how it works. Pentecost is always after the Passover. Now, you remember the Passover, right? That's when, they, when, they, when, they, uh, when Jesus Christ gathered the disciples together at the last supper and when they would eat the lamb and as were demonstrated by our children how they would eat the different foods that were put before them and they were prepared uh, and then there was a remembrance of how God had delivered them from the land. Now what you would do is you would go to the Passover now the Passover could, it was just like Christmas. It was like it could be on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday Sabbath. It could be on any of those days. So the Passover after the Passover came when the Passover was over you would wait till the following Sabbath. Now, that'd be like if we did something on Tuesday, then we're not going to start counting until we get to Saturday. Okay, so they would go from the Passover to the nearest Sabbath, and then they would go seven weeks. Now, how many days is seven weeks? Anybody remember? Okay, it's 49. Seven times seven equals 49. So they would wait 50 days. All right, now by that, what they did is they waited. They had to have a full seven days. And if you went on the, on, the, on the 49th day, it would be on the same day that started. This is, wouldn't be on the same day. They wanted to be the next week, so it was the next the beginning of the next week when the Passover would come. So exactly 50 days after the Passover from, from the, the final Saturday or the final Sabbath, it would be 50 days from them until Pentecost would come. By the way, does anybody know what Pentecost means? Here you go. You ready? You want to know? 50. 50. It's the 50th day after the, second, after the first Sabbath after Passover. Y'all got that? So if I give you a test tonight, y'all are going to remember when the Passover is, right? Probably not. You're probably going to forget that too. But, but it's just good to know that information so we've got that in our head so we know what's going on. Now, the day of Pentecost was established in the book of Leviticus. Now, I, I know that many of y'all labor and you read the book. Of, how many of y'all woke up this morning and just read the book of Leviticus before you got here? Okay, well, okay, 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 okay. We love to read, uh, we love to read the scriptures, but sometimes we get bogged down in the book of Leviticus. And in chapter 23, we're going to find out where that's how they figured out when Pentecost was going to be. It was the day set aside to celebrate the giving of the law. Now, you remember how the law came? How, do you remember how the people, how did the people get the law? Does anybody remember? It came through Moses, and how did Moses get the law? He went up on top of the mountain. God spoke face to face with him, gave him the law, gave him the Ten Commandments, brought, and he brought that back down to them. And the people were overjoyed that they'd gotten the information from God on how they were supposed to live their lives. So that they called that, they, they came down and they would celebrate that as a Passover. And that was the day that they remembered. They built these little booths and they'd go out and sleep in them for a while, and they would celebrate the giving of the law. Now, in the New Testament, when we look at the Passover, over, we don't celebrate the giving of the law, and the reason we don't celebrate the giving of the law because the law has been fulfilled. Now, who was it that fulfilled the law? Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. So we don't celebrate Passover and say, thank you, Jesus, for giving us, well, thank you, God, for giving us the law. We celebrate the Passover, and we thank God for giving us the Holy Spirit who comes and lives inside of us. Because the Holy Spirit can now live in us. In chapter 2, we're going to see where, for the first time, the church is born. This is when the Holy Spirit, God gives the Holy Spirit, fills those 120 believers, fills some others who have come in around there, and they're able to go out and to share with everything, everyone that's coming around. Now, I find this quite interesting, though. This is one of those interesting tidbits of information that just kind of blows my mind. I found this several years ago. If you go back into the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis, you got, uh, uh, you know, Cain and uh, uh, kills his brother Abel, and, and there's all kinds of things. And then all of a sudden, the people begin to feel figure things out. And they began to figure out that they could build this tower. Y'all remember what the name of the tower was? 
It was the Tower of Babel. Now, does anybody know why they called it the Tower of Babel? Because by the time they got through building the tower, everybody was babbling. Right, this is what happened. They, they were so excited to build this tower, they figured out how to make bricks. So they built them this big, huge tower, and they built the tower so that they could make a name for themselves. Not for God. They wanted to stand up upon the world and say, look, we are king of the world. Look at all the things that we have done. And because God comes down from heaven according to scripture in the, in the Hebrew language, he looks, it makes it look like he laid down on the ground and he looked and just barely in the, in the corner of his eye, he could see this little tower that the people had made. And since they had tried to, uh, to build that tower and come together and they said to themselves, if we can come together and we can build this tower, then we can do anything. And what they were saying, saying was they didn't need God anymore. God had given them one instruction and he had told them to be fruitful and what? Multiply. Fill the earth. Go forth and fill up the earth. But here they were coming back into the town, coming in and they were doing the opposite of what God told them to do. So when they did that, God struck them and caused them to speak in a whole bunch of different languages so they could no longer communicate with one another and the only thing they could do was just pull off and make countries of their own and go and fill up the earth. In other words, God forced them to do exactly what it was that he told them to do, and they did it in, they, they did it in disobedience, but they had to do what God does because he's absolutely sovereign. Now, Jesus Christ has come back. Jesus has come. He's risen from the grave. The Holy Spirit is fixing to establish the church, and as it establishes the church... God is going to cause these people who were there in that prayer meeting for those who, who have come to know, those the ones who are ahead of everybody and already understand that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who ascended into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. He is going to cause them to begin to speak in unknown languages. Unknown to the people. The languages are going to be known to the people who hear them, but they're going to be unknown to the people who are speaking them. It's as if you came here this morning and when you left here this morning, Morning. You came in not knowing how to speak Spanish, but when you left out, you could go to the local quick stop and you could talk to the Spanish people that you came and talked. It's as if you came in here and there was some Vietnamese down there shrimping and you wanted to talk to them. And you could just go up to them and start speaking in Vietnamese. I mean, God is empowering them to be able to communicate to them what he wants to communicate to them. And what he wants to communicate to them is all the great works that God has done. More specifically, how he has sent Jesus to die on the cross and raise from the grave. So now that the people are scattered out all over the earth, God is sending the gospel out all over the earth so that they can find out what they need to know. And that's what we're going to see in our text. So having said all of that, let's go to our text this morning, which is uh, uh, Acts chapter 2, beginning of verse 1. After, after 10 days of prayer meetings here, when the day of Pentecost had arrived, the, the traditional day, uh, 50 days after the Passover, after the last Sabbath, after the first Sabbath, after that. They were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a violent rushing wind. Now, it doesn't say there was a wind. It says there was a sound like a violent rushing wind. Wind. So we don't even know if the wind was actually blowing. We just know it sounded like that. Maybe you've been, maybe you've been in a tornado. I always hear people who have been in tornadoes. They say, "Well, it sounded like a freight train when it was coming to because that sound." So that's the kind of sound that they got. Suddenly, a sound like a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. And and tongues like flames of fire that were divided appeared to them and rested on them. So something like fire, something that looks like tongues is inside the building with them and it just falls down on top of them. And it appeared to them and it rested on each one of them. So nobody's left out. This is all of them. Then they were all filled with, what were they filled with? The Holy Spirit. And what did they do? They began to speak in different tongues or different languages as the Spirit had given them ability to speak. And there were some Jews living in Jerusalem, some devout men from every nation under heaven. Now let me stop and tell you this right now. At Pentecost, this is a holiday. This is a Jewish holiday. Jews from all over the world would come into Jerusalem so that they could be here. And, and there's going to be a list in just a minute. It's going to name all of these towns where all of these people had come from. It's as if there was going to be a Southern Baptist convention or any convention that you can imagine, and it's going to be centered in Atlanta, Georgia. 
so everybody gets on a Delta Airlines. Why do they get on Delta? Because Delta always goes through Atlanta. You can't go to anywhere without unless you go to, and you bring all of these people into there and suddenly everybody steps off the airport and inside the airport all of these people from all the different speaking, some people are speaking Southern, some people are speaking Yankee, some people are speaking Midwestern, some people, some people are, are how you doing? I mean, I mean, they got all this different. And all of a sudden, somebody begins to speak, and everybody in there can hear what they need to hear. There were these, uh, these were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crowd came together, and they were confused because each one of them heard them speaking in his own language. Okay, a foreigner comes to town, and they're listening, but they're hearing these people speak in the language that they're used to hearing so that they can understand it. All right? he was, it was confusing. Picking up in verse 7. And they were astonished and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Now, let me, let me, let me translate that into South Mississippi. It would be like coming in and saying, who are all of these geniuses that are talking and speaking in different languages and we know they're just a bunch of rednecks from Mississippi. All right? So they've got, they've got this ability that they can communicate. Galileans were nobody. They were common folk. How is it that each of you can hear in our own native language? Parthians, Medians, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia and Judah and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and uh, fire, for, for whatever that place is, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, uh, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabs were here, were hear them speak magnificent acts of God in their own languages. In other words, they could hear and understand what they were saying, and they were all astonished and perplexed, saying to one another, What could this be? But some sneered and said, <laughs> ah, They're full of new wine. They're just drunk. And all God's people said, uh, Y'all ever been around a drunk before? All right, that's what, they, that's what they think about them right here. What I want to do this morning is I want to focus on five things with respect to the Holy Spirit. Now, always remember that the Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is not a substance. The Holy Spirit is spirit, but it is also God. It is the Spirit of Jesus. It is the Spirit of God. God does not have to have a body. When he does have a body, we call him Jesus. God the Father existed, created everything, and within him is the body, which is Jesus, and then within him also is the Spirit. So when the Spirit comes to live in you, it is God himself who is living in you. First thing I want to point out to you today that happened on that Pentecost is... The Holy Spirit fulfilled. Everybody say that. The Holy Spirit fulfilled. Now, if you remember Jesus in the book of John, when he was with the disciples, that's when he began to tell them, said, look, I know y'all aren't going to understand this yet, but there's coming a time when you're going to understand this. I'm not going to be with you anymore. But it's a good thing that I'm not going to be with you anymore because if I go, when I go... God himself, the Holy Spirit, is going to come and live inside of you and it's going to change everything. In fact, Jesus said, you are going to do greater miracles than I do and one of the greater miracles that's going to take place is when the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. Look at what that text says on the board above me. And it comes from John chapter 14 where Jesus said, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor. All right? So we need a counselor. How many of y'all are kind of crazy in your own head? Ooh, 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 ooh. And I need a counselor. And that counselor is the Holy Spirit to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. So when he's in there, he's going to speak the truth. The world is unable to receive him because not, it does not see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. In other words, Jesus ascended up, sat down at the right hand of the Father, and the Spirit of Jesus came down and came into the hearts of the people. And that's exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost, and that's exactly what happened 
on the day that you came to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit moved into you and changed who you are. While Jesus was with his disciples, he let them know that he was going to sit at the right hand of the Father. And what they would learn, what they would learn later was that the Holy Spirit would be the agent of God who would indwell the people, his people, to, to form a physical presence of Jesus here on earth. Now, Jesus one day will return physically. His physical body is going to come back and, and in that new regenerate, that new body that he has. Until that day, as we wait for him, we are going to be the body of Christ ourselves. Since Jesus is Jesus' body is sitting at the right hand of the Father, but Jesus has a body that is physically present here on the earth. And we have a name for that body that is physically here on earth. Does anybody know what the name of it is? It's the church. It's you and me. I, I love that song that says, Lord, why didn't you? Why didn't you? Why didn't you? Why didn't you? And all of a sudden he said, he, he said I did. I created you. And that's what we the church do. When the orphans don't have fathers, we go be their fathers. When the widows don't have money to feed their, feed their, feed their souls, feed their bodies, we go and feed the widows. We are Jesus' body carrying out the things he wants to do. We can do that because we have Jesus inside of us and it's together we are the body of Christ. Second thing I want us to pull from the text as we look at the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit came. Everybody say the Holy Spirit came. He did. The coming of the Holy Spirit is not a metaphorical statement. It is a literal statement. I remember I'm teaching you that there are some metaphorical statements that are, that are, that are words that explain something that's physical that we can use to understand it, but it's not, they're, not, they're not what it says it is, but it's a picture to paint so we can understand a greater thing. The Holy Spirit coming to earth is a literal thing that actually takes place. The body of Christ is a living, moving being who carries out the desires of the Father. Just like Jesus on the earth carried out the desires of the Father, the Holy Spirit comes in us, and as us, with the Spirit in us, we carry out the things that God intends for us to carry out. Before the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit would indwell some of God's people in the Old Testament, but he would only indwell them for a period of time, and then he would go and he would go back up into heaven. So God, when God wanted somebody to carry out a task that he wanted them to carry out, many times he would send the Holy Spirit to indwell and infuse that person so that they could go and carry out and do what they're supposed to do. Samson is a good example of this. Now, y'all remember who Samson was. Did Samson always do what God wanted him to do? Absolutely not. I mean, he's one, of the, he's one of the worst saints in the Old Testament that we can find. But the Holy Spirit would fill Samson. Samson would go and do these astounding things, tear doors off the walls, carry them on. I mean, he'd take a lion and slay, you know, slay people. With, and, and he'd eat. I mean, he just did all kinds. If you, don't, if you go back and read the book of Judges, you see all the wonderful, wonderful things that he was able to do. But he did that because the Holy Spirit was in him. But there was a time when the Holy Spirit left him. And then at the end of his life, he cried back out to God. And without his hair, without his eyes, all those things, God takes the Holy Spirit, puts it back in him, and he's able to crush the building that he's in, and all the Philistines die in there. See, that's the way God did things in the Old Testament. David, David was full of God's Spirit. But remember when David sinned, if you go back to Psalm 51, he says, but God, please do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Because in the Old Testament, God could take the Holy Spirit from somebody. But in the New Testament time, that does not happen. That Holy Spirit is always inside of us. New Testament believers, will, uh, as New Testament believers, we experience what the Old Testament saints did not. All right, we got something that they didn't get, and that's the Holy Spirit. That's God himself living in us as we carry out what the, the acts that we carry out here on earth, a permanent presence of God inside of our being. The Holy Spirit is in us, and he will never leave us. In fact, he is the glue that God uses to hold all of us together as the body of Christ. Third thing I want you to get from the text today is this. The Holy Spirit baptized. Everybody say that. The Holy Spirit baptized. Now, if we've got to back up a chapter to get the verse that goes along with that so we fully see that picture, we're going to see it here. But, but, but in, uh, one, one verse back, we see where, where for John baptized with water, 
but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now that's what Jesus said as he ascended up into heaven. Ten days later it's Pentecost. Not many days from the day when he ascended up into heaven. Now the Holy Spirit is baptizing them, coming down on them. Last week we said not all believers are baptized with water, but they all are baptized with the Holy Spirit. Here in our text today, we see that the, the day that, uh, here in our text today, we see the day that a, a sound like a rushing wind and a sight like tongues of fire fall down from heaven. These are things that can be heard, things that can be seen. On this day, the Jewish people were given an opportunity to surrender themselves to Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. And over 3,000 people came to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Now when those 3,000 people come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior, we don't see that they speak in an unknown language. We don't, we don't see that because God didn't have a purpose for that. But he will later when the Gentile people come to him because he wants the Gentiles to go out and communicate to the Gentiles out there. On this day, there were Jewish people from, get this, 15 different nations that spoke 15 different languages who just happened to be in Jerusalem for Pentecost. Now, I don't know how many of y'all have ever traveled in a foreign land. How many of y'all have ever been off American soil and gone to a foreign land? Okay, we've got, we got a well-traveled congregation right here. If you've ever been to a country where they didn't speak English and you didn't speak the language in the country that you went into, didn't it make you feel kind of weird? Somebody will walk up and they'll look at you and they'll go, ha, 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 that's a... <laughs> and then turn around and walk off. And you're sitting there thinking, did he say I had a big nose and I was fat? And you know, you think of all kinds of things that you thought that they were thinking because you just don't know. Right? And you wish that you could just hear what it was that they were saying. Well, that's what happened on this day. These people have come into a foreign land where only they probably only be able to communicate with a couple of handful of people. Maybe they're speaking some Aramaic and they got some kind of common language, but they're, they're, maybe they speak. Uh, maybe they they could speak Aramaic like I can speak uh, uh, me, uh, not Mexican Spanish. Okay, I went into I went into Coco Loco not long ago and they had this new female waitress that had come from down south of the border somewhere and she came up to me. She I, she walked up and I said hola and she. Smiled and she gave me, said, you know, and she comes back in a few minutes and I said, I said, gracias. And she came back in a few minutes later and when she, she looked at me, she said, I got everything. I said, whoa, whoa. I got 20 words, I know. And if you don't use those 20 words, well, you know. <laughs> yeah, some of y'all may have been there, I don't know. But when these guys, when these people had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the giving of the law, what they saw was that the law had been fulfilled in Jesus and now 120 different people are speaking in over 15 different languages to be able to communicate what has just taken place in Jerusalem just 50, 90, 100 days earlier when Jesus died on the cross. God will do miraculous things to get the gospel into the hearts and the lives of the people that he's calling to be saved. How many of y'all have been baptized with the Holy Spirit? I have, I have. Should be every believer in here has been baptized with the Holy Spirit. But there's also something that we see in the text today that I want to make sure that you understand there's a difference between the two. There's the baptizing, uh, Holy Spirit baptizes, but not only is the Holy Spirit baptized, the Holy Spirit filled. The Holy Spirit filled. Everybody say that. The Holy Spirit filled. Field. Now, what is filled? Then they were, what is it? The text says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So there's a difference between being baptized with the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, Warren Wiersbe, as I was reading this week, had a really good quote. And I'm going to throw this quote up there for you. This is the way he said it. Baptism of the Spirit means that you belong to the body of Christ. The filling of the Spirit means that your body belongs to Christ. 
Uh, and, and that really resonated in my head. But sometimes when I'm trying to work something out so I'll understand it, I'll get me a pencil and I'll get one of those little no yellow notepads out and I'll begin to write little sayings because I, my brain can only think in about a sentence, maybe two sentences at the most. Usually if I use a run-on sentence, my brain even works better, okay? So I, I, that's, why, that's the reason I use so many semicolons because I'm just too lazy to capitalize the next letter. Okay, uh, anyway, I get down and I start writing those things. And I wrote down three different statements as I was trying to process this. Let me read you the statements that I wrote down. Number one, I wrote down, baptism of the Spirit unites me into the body of Christ. So you get that? You, baptism of the Holy Spirit unites me with you because the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what glues me to you. All right, so now we are one body. Let me finish the statement. Baptism with Spirit unites us into the body of Christ while the filling of the Spirit compels me to give my, myself fully to Christ. Okay, first I'm glued to you and then after I'm glued with you, by the filling of the Spirit, I want to be who it is that God wants me to be. I want to be who it is that you already think that I'm supposed to be. And, and you want to be who it is that you think I, that I think you're supposed to be through the Word of God. Of course, I'm, my mind's still having a hard time to get this. So I get down, I, I, scratch, I scratch over that, and I go to the next thing. I write down this so I can understand. Being baptized by the Spirit renders me holy. In other words, since I'm baptized by the Holy Spirit, I got a stamp of holiness upon me before God. But I already know that I'm not holy. I'm always dealing with this in my life. I know that I'm declared holy, but I know that I don't act holy. Okay, so finishing the statement. Baptized by the Spirit uh, renders me holy. Being filled with the Spirit empowers me and pushes me to walk in holiness. Okay, because the Holy Spirit is in me, the Holy Spirit is kicking and screaming, trying to take over the whole inside of who I am. Therefore, I have learned that when I can kill me, in me, not my physical body, but the, the ego, the me thing, the I part of me, when I can kill that, then the Holy Spirit can swell up and take over inside of me. And as the Holy Spirit swells up and takes over inside of me, I start acting the way that I should act because God now has control over the things that I do in my life. In case, in case I couldn't still get that, I came down and wrote one third statement right here and this is my third statement. The baptizing of the Spirit unites. The filling of the Spirit transforms. In other words, the baptism of the Spirit makes us one body but that Holy Spirit in us will not let us stay who we are. It's going to force us to become looking more like Jesus. Let me pitch you in on a piece of information. You can't tell always if somebody's been baptized by the Spirit. But you can always tell when a person is filled with the Spirit. Because when a person is filled by the Spirit, there's a radical transformation that is taking place in their lives. God begins to use them in ways that you know that God, that they will do things that their mental capability or their physical capability would not have let them do that. But because Christ is in them, they'll be able to accomplish things that they shouldn't have been able to accomplish because the Spirit of God is in them. Fifth and last thing I want to tell you that happened on that day with the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit spoke. Everybody say, the Holy Spirit spoke. Okay, all right. We hear them speaking in magnificent, uh, speaking the magnificent acts of God. In other words, what they were speaking when they were able to communicate in the language, in the tongues that the people could understand, they were talking about all the things that Jesus had done. They had gone by. You remember when Jesus saw the two guys on the road to Emmaus? Does anybody remember what he talked about? He talked about the Old Testament and how it predicted that Jesus was going to come. When these guys began to speak, they're talking to the Jews who had come from all over the world to celebrate the giving of the law, so they began to speak to them about the law and how the law said that Jesus would come and when Jesus came, he would fulfill the law and when he fulfilled the law, you're going to know this is who it is when it happens. And those people were able to put two and two together. They were able to take the Old Testament, see that Jesus fits what's in the Old Testament and all of a sudden the blinders were peeled back from their eyes and they came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They were radically changed. They they were glued into the family of God and now the Spirit began to change who they were in their lives. The filling of the Spirit gives the believer boldness and the ability to communicate the truth of God to people in a way that they can understand 
What they spoke was praise for the acts of God. And that's exactly what God does to you and me. He comes inside him. He indwells us when we're baptized. We come together, we listen to the word, and we think to ourselves, well, you know, I'd love to share the gospel with somebody to come in contact with, but I'm just too bashful. I'm just too introverted. I, just, I don't even like to look people in their eyes. I have, you know, from my childhood, I've got to think where I hold my eyes down most of the time instead of looking in people's eyes. I've had to make myself learn to pick my eyes up and look straight in the people's eyes. But then what the Holy Spirit does is it gives us the ability to tell what the Lord has done for us, to tell what we've learned in the Word of God. These 120 people, don't you reckon out of the 120 people that were in the upper room, there was all kinds of people? Don't you reckon there was boisterous extroverts who just loved the crowds and loved to stand up and, and talk and take charge? And don't you reckon there were those people that just kind of wanted to blend in with the crowd and not have anybody see them? Maybe the, the absolute introverts that don't, even, that don't want to look up at people. Yet when the Holy Spirit comes on all 120 of these, these individuals, they begin to prophesy and fulfill exactly what Amos had said in the Old Testament. Your young men will dream dreams and they will see visions and they will begin to speak and say what God has done. The filling of the Holy Spirit, well, let me, let me, let me stop with a couple of questions. I want to end right here and ask a couple of questions. Number one, have you been baptized by the Spirit? Have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Has the Holy Spirit come in? If you're not, if you have not, then you are lost and you need to be saved. In order for the, the Spirit to take over control of your life, you've got to surrender and let Jesus Christ be Lord of your life. You've got to confess that Jesus is Lord. You've got to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And as you do, the Holy Spirit will infill you and you will become a born-again believer of Jesus Christ. But, but I sense that most of the folks at the 830 service have already passed that point. If you hadn't passed that point, we'll get you past that point this morning when we give an invitation. But I think most of you are going to fall into this category where I ask you this second question. Are you currently filled with the Spirit? Because I know that this is what happens a lot of times. People get, they, 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 they come to know Christ. They're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. They get on fire for Christ. And then they have these swellings and detractions. Swelling, well, I used to really be close to the Lord, but now I've kind of slid back and I'm not where I used to be. Sometimes we call it backsliding. The filling of the Holy Spirit, when you are full of the Spirit, you're going to seem like a drunk person. You know, the scripture says, but some sneered and said, they're full of new wine. Paul makes a strange analogy when he's writing a letter to Ephesus. In writing a letter to Ephesus, he said these words, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless action but be filled with the Spirit. So why did he say don't get drunk and be filled with the Spirit? The reason he did that is people kind of look the same way. One is under the influence of alcohol. If you drive, you get a DUI. The other is under the influence of the Holy Spirit. If you drive, you get a DUHS, I guess. I don't know. But shouldn't we all walk around like we're filled with the Spirit? Shouldn't we all be giddy because of what Jesus has done for us? I mean, it just overwhelms me to think that Jesus is kicking the me out of me so Jesus can be Jesus in me. Because anything that anybody likes about me is not the me that's in me. It's the Jesus that's in me. What the people don't like about me, it's the me that's in me that they don't like. Dear God in heaven,